HR, tech, data-driven culture, it's also a topic that can be a bit non-graspable and, and sort of non-tangible. So where do I start? What are the practical use cases, for example? And this is something that I would like us to outline, um, because I know that you all come from different areas, so you will all sort of share your expertise in, in, in your area and how one can apply, apply data to your, to your area of exp expertise. So to set the context and to kick it off, I would actually like to ask all of you to share how you're working with, with data and analytics in the area of HR within your organizations or with your products. Stefania, do you want to go ahead? Sure, does this work now? Yeah. Uh, can I also say I'm, I, I, I'm feeling a little bit um, conscious that you're out of the light. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We can yeah. move a little here. Come closer. I, we can also maybe hire like an Instagram husband, you know, that just does the lights for us or something. No, okay. Yeah, it's actually fine actually sitting in the dark. <laughs> <laughs> okay. yeah. All right. Uh, yeah, so I'm Stefania. Uh, I am a mathematician and a philosopher that uh, went into sort of genetics research and then into business um, analysis, I guess you can call it, for a game, quiz game that had 100 million users around the world, so I was doing product analytics and user behavior analytics. So that's roughly my background. Um, I scaled up a data team there um, and scaled up a data culture within the company, basically. Uh, or I didn't do it, we did it. It was a group effort. Um, so one of the things that we were doing for sort of um, internal analysis was, for example, we sent out a lot of Google form surveys to see how we could better serve other people in the company. Um, because uh, we were building a data-driven culture, helping people making decisions uh, based on data, whether it be product or market or whatever. Um, so we commonly sent out surveys to people to find out where we could improve our services to uh, internal people, for example. So that's a, an example. But obviously then also do a lot of product analytics, basically. So. Yeah. Cool, very interesting. Yeah, I think HR and yeah, retention employee experience, I think that's a commonly commonly used and very powerful area for And we actually did a lot of that also outside of the data area. So, for example, the kitchen, the canteen started doing this stuff as well, sending out surveys what people liked uh, about the food and stuff like that. So, mm -hmm. and I think that those are small things you can do to really improve employee experience. Definitely. Kave, do you want to share your experience? Great. So I'm Kave, Kave Bulambo, and uh, just for background purposes, I'm the founder of my career path, we're a career coaching and placement organization, and our purpose is really to prepare young people to embrace the 21st century job market because we just feel there's a mismatch between expectations and reality. So we try to prepare young people to embrace the market. And secondly, I'm also a talent acquisition and brand specialist at, uh, at HighBooks. HighBooks is an audiobook platform, an app that you can download right now if you want to. <laughs> and we are based in San Francisco, but we also uh, have offices here in Berlin. And overall, I have been in the recruitment world for the last three years now. And currently, I'm focusing on recruiting engineers and data centers, data analysts, and the works. And the way that we try to use data right now in my current and previous companies is really first to attract talent. So depending on the size of the companies that I've been at, most of the time, we're known or we're not known. So attraction is the key area that we try to improve on there in terms of data that's coming in. And then the second element that we try to use data with is to optimize the candidate experience. So how do we make sure the process from application to hire is better and good that it benefits the candidate but also the company? And of course we use different tools to do this. And the second thing that we, or the third thing that we try to do also, even at this stage, is really to try and, and check our pulse as a company to improve culture. And the way that we try to do this is to collect first an NPS score from the employees themselves within the candidates and also do uh, a survey um, to candidates as well that are incoming. Um, yeah. 
Cool. And Daria, I know that from, from your side, I mean, being the CEO and founder of, of Bunch, that's probably more from a product perspective. So tell us a yeah, little bit exactly. more about so that. So I think it would be um, less interesting to talk uh, only about our team. I'm um, Daria, the co-founder and CEO of Bunch AI. Um, I think it's more interesting to look at the topic um, from product and customer's perspective in our case, because um, even though we sometimes don't uh, position ourselves as such, um, we are in the HR market, of course. So um, Bunch AI um, uses psychology, um, data, and um, modern technologies like machine learning um, to help companies to bring in people analytics into people decisions. We um, build products around it, but we also have projects with um, more bigger enterprise customers. The products that we've built in the past um, year where we've gained um, companies like N26, DigitalOcean, and the likes as customers um, are mainly focused on empowering better decision making around recruiting and hiring um, with the perspective of building um, better teams. And I think the most interesting, um, this might all sound very uh, uh, abstract, I'm aware of that. Um, I think the biggest or the best way to understand what we're doing literally is um, when I was a psychologist, I used to work um, at, on the border between like business strategy and customers and, and um, leaders in the end. And what I've learned is that um, in the world of research of psychology, organizational psychology, neuroscience, whatever, um, social realms, we know so much about how human behavior potentially works uh, with its limitations and there is definitely a lot of more to discover but there is so much knowledge already out there that is entirely disconnected from the actual practitioner's world. So our agenda I think with the, the business is to actually bring relevant database people insights at the moments and the touch points when leaders and teams are actually making decisions around people. So instead of basically going the route of um, you leader need to go and actually train yourself in a long workshop and you need to learn all these theories and so on, we actually basically produce products that help you to understand what you need to know about the psychology of a person at the moment when that happens. And so our latest product that we've um, will be releasing, um, it's currently in a closed beta test yet, um, is a Chrome extension that lives on top of LinkedIn information, basically grasps publicly available information about you and actually creates a psychological profile and gives the hiring manager the opportunity to not only understand what might be interesting and relevant to you, what might motivate you, what you might be looking for, but also gives tips on actually how to structure the interview and how to convince you to come join that particular um, company and what really matters to you. So we start empowering much higher per level of personalization and the candidate experience at this hiring touch point. I'm so excited. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, my name is Jerome Bucker. Can I have a song? Please. Not only in the dark. <laughs> but do, do switch. Thank you so much. You're totally in the uh, dark. My name there. is Jerome Bucker. I'm the founder and CEO of BlindFee.com and we seek to change the way people actually understand themselves and each other but also how we can actually help people create work that matters. And the reason why we focus on this is because we think it's actually the most important problem that we face today because we really lack as a society and also as people amongst each other really the perspective and the understanding of like how actually, uh, what's the noise in other people's heads. So one of the things that we actually did and my background is actually nothing to do with HR. I'm a professional racing car driver that stopped his career because he had a severe accident and uh, nothing with racing, jet ski, whatever, it was like I had a bit of too much uh, adrenaline pump seeking adventure me. Um, and from there I actually started my own company in nanotechnology. From there, after that was sold, I ended up in different software companies that were uh, in total now sold for 1.8 billion dollars. And while that number sounds really cool, internally it was a total shit show, right? And the funny thing was is that when we talk about culture, are all these like really fake things what actually happens? We we measure all these outcomes and we measure engagement and we measure all the type of things that we think actually helps us to understand things. But the reality was is that it really depends on the game you're trying to play, right? So the way we actually start looking at it, like game theory, is that you have two types of games. You have finite games, you have infinite games. And a finite game is this idea that you have known players playing against other known players with known rules and everybody agrees on the outcome, right? So sports is a great example of this. But infinite games are games where you have known players competing against unknown players with unknown rules and nobody agrees about what winning looks like. And this is the game of business. And the reality is, is what we found is that, okay, so 
actually the way our society start to work, whether it's like uh, social media, with Facebook, LinkedIn, uh, Instagram, they're all games. We're playing games all the time. We're optimizing for followers, for Instagram, for how many connections we have on LinkedIn. And it's like a pre it's pretending the way we actually want to be perceived by others. But we thought, okay, how could we actually create a world where people are actually looked at by their actual contributions, right? So where, for developers, this is quite easy. So you can see this, for example, with GitHub, right? You, you publish and you can see what you're contributing to open source projects. But when it actually comes to like other people and other professions, it becomes very, very difficult. So what we started doing is that we did a lot of experiments. We've been a lot like uh, the way you would call stealth. And we did a lot of their different experimentation. And one of these was is that we thought, okay, instead of thinking of HR like in culture and engagement surveys that nobody likes filling in, because the, the way we looked at it is that HR is done to people. It's not done for people. So the way we thought about this, okay, what's the most important thing why people are actually frustrated or they feel their culture doesn't work? Because they address issues that are not dealt with. So we launched an experiment where people could anonymously submit issues uh, in their company. We got this at uh, companies like Uber last year and LinkedIn and Airbnb. And at the time, there was also a lot of shit happening at Uber. So we could see actually a lot of stuff before it actually became public. But one of the things that we also found is that anonymity, where most of the HR tech is based on, creates only more toxicity. So we've built an entire industry with tools with for sort of like beliefs that we think, ah, oh, this is the way it will work and people feel psychologically safe if we provide anonymity. The reality is you create only more toxicity. And we could measure this by actually looking at the comments of people, how it would develop and would catapult. And you see the same on social media, right? Um, and what we are doing now is that we, we went a lot of different other ways where we said, okay, let's, how we could capture people's believability, right? So what an ultimate company would look like is that you have as least levels of hierarchy, right? Because hierarchies and bureaucracies are actually progress, stop people from progressing really smoothly and actually contribute instead of just manage processes. And we thought, okay, one of the ways we could actually do this is by making it really transparent about people's contributions. And what we do internally, next to the fact that we do a big five trade personality tasks, we have like user manuals, how to use people, or like how to actually work with me, all those type of things. What we actually found mostly is like it are the behaviors of people. So you can look at a lot what people filling in, what they say they actually want to do, but the most important thing to actually see what a person's contribution is by their actions and behaviors. And we capture that and we actually turn it into what we call like a, um, uh, um, a believability score, what we can then use and actually, okay, when we make decisions that sort of incorporate it in and people are made aware of their actual behavior. So, and this is based on instead of like cultural values that are often really fake and nobody agrees on what that actually means, we have values where it's super clear, this is what we value, but this is what we devalue, right? So the problem with a lot of these things when we talk about culture is that it, has, it is not explicitly clear who are you not for. The same that your product and your company is not for everyone. Your culture should not be for everyone. It's a really false belief. So if you, if you make that really clear up front, people actually know how to actually behave. They know when actually, you know, what the results would be if you don't follow some of these things. And we also can get fired because this is the most toxic um, amplifier in companies is that it becomes really vague when are people fired, when are people not performing. And that starts at the beginning, but you need to make it really clear up front, not when somebody got fired. Yeah, I, th I think you're yeah, touching upon sort of pitfalls and, and uh, things that can go wrong when, when applying data and analytics. It's also something that I want to dig deeper into a bit later. But first, uh, Daria, you said something really interesting. You said, we're, we're an HR tool, I'm paraphrasing now, we're an HR tool, although we don't want to position us like, like one. And I think to build a data-driven culture or to build a culture of any sorts, one has to blur the lines between different functions. It cannot sit, for example, with, with, a, with a three people function, for example, with, with, um, with HR, if one wants to really go through the whole uh, organization and build, build a data-driven culture. So how, how, does one, how does one do that? Um, so this is a very interesting question because in the end it's really not about us like who do we want to be right it's about whom do we serve and what problem do we solve and what we found out is if we want to appeal to Bjorn or um, any other decision maker that doesn't associate himself uh, with HR 
and also doesn't believe in the world in the old way um, of doing it, which I also don't. However, I do challenge some of your comments. Um, I think um, you need to understand what matters to these people. And so the reason why we position ourselves as an analytics and as a machine learning company um, and as a psychological company in the end is because um, what we've learned is that there is a much bigger hunger around understanding people's behaviors, whatever the methods, be it very um, easy, approachable, very high level methods that are oftentimes very good enough to make the relevant decisions. Sometimes, specifically when it comes to bigger data sets and more complex decisions um, that are uh, not so easy to reverse as giving a feedback that maybe was not rightfully given or so on, um, you need to have more transparency, reliability, and quality on data. Then it's very important that you actually um, use statistical methods to get to the point of it. And so I think um, what we see is that people do want to understand people's behaviors. They do want to use all sorts of tools that help them do that, from design thinking and user research and interviewing techniques and just collecting qualitative feedback to actually utilize data. Um, and they don't think that's HR. They think that's like plain doing business. Like I'm doing business with people, I might also educate myself about what drives my team forward, what doesn't, what rules do I need to set with them, what do I not need to actually achieve my business goals. And all of this has spurred like this whole movement around that I think was started way before the Google Aristotle project. But I think that's a very good example where a big enterprise actually underpins the beginnings of people analytics, how we know them today, where you actually bring together social scientists, psychologists, statisticians, data scientists, and actually give them this very blurry high level task of please find out what makes our team successful. And really let them do the work for years before I think it took them like four or five years to actually publish research, and you might be familiar with the New Yorker article where like the five, the five factors that drive teams forward, where psychological safety was one of them. Um, I, what I'm trying to say is I think in the end, when you actually look into data and HR, one thing that we understood is you really need to speak the language that the people speak that you're delivering to. So it's really not about who you are, what product you sell, what you're trying to, position yourself or not, like you need to understand the problem you're solving and you need to pick the right methods to actually solve it and then deliver it in such a way that they can take it. Um, and I do have a follow-up question. I'm not sure whether I'm um, allowed to do that or not, but I'm just going to do that. <laughs> as long as you keep the answer <laughs> short. <laughs> yes. Um, you said something very interesting. I think I agree that we used to see um, this whole HR like measurement feel very one-sided. Like surveys were all we knew and then we do... Um, reliability analysis on them, and then we display averages like per, per, like per team, per division, per whatever. And I don't agree that it's like, that's not enough. However, I think from what you were depicting, I think there is a very interesting aspect that we need to look at. Um, referring to this Google research, psychological safety came out as the number one driver in teams. So I'm wondering, like, how do you guys deal with the fact that if you actually make full transparency in some cultures, that may lead to the exact opposite of what you're trying to achieve because actually there is going to be people that are feeling very psychologically unsafe and they can't really say what they need to say and they don't have enough voicing behavior because it's a shit show. So how do you deal with this dynamic? I think it's a really fair question, right? You always have the issue of, like, once you start a culture is that it's sort of set in and it's really difficult to change the culture. And you have all these like typical states that, or like uh, quotes that say, you know, like the culture changes with the CEO or changes with the founder or changes with the management. And I agree to some extent, but what, do, what we found is, and we did a lot of experiments with this, is that it is not that first trust needs to happen before people become transparent. Like what we found is that you actually become first transparent and trust slowly starts to emerge. But it's also true is that full, like super radical transparency doesn't work for everyone, right? So the way we're doing it is that we document literally everything that we do, like every meeting that I have, even though if it's with investors or it's with customers, I document everything and everybody can see everything. Everybody can even access my emails if they want to, right? Like, like principles from Ray Talia. Yeah, it's, like, it's very similar to that. And what we found is that, yes, it's for some people it's not so super comfortable, right? So. What we did is that we did these big five trade personality assessment and we found, for example, people who are really high in neuroticism find this really, really difficult, right? These, there's a lot of stress, they're really easily uh, influenced by external stressors. And what we did is that we made a really uh, open platform that like at the morning is that everybody gets together and we address like what are the stuff that's blocking people. And it sounds, 
this is not like data-driven stuff, right? This is just like common sense. You need to ask people, let them speak. And you as a leader are supposed to shut up and speak last. That's what you're supposed to do. You're not just there to supposed to speak first and put your opinion on top of people. And when we did this long enough, when we encouraged people enough, then the transparency actually works to their benefit, right? So, and the same actually happens when we have, we have certain habits that we call like fuck up Fridays, right? Where literally, like I start actually, and so that's the only exception I don't uh, uh, speak last, is that I say like these are my fuck ups of the week. This is where I failed. This is where I fell short. And what we found is that really helps people to say, oh shit, actually I can also just say that actually something is not bothering me. And this is of course like some habits that you need to incorporate before you can say, oh, let's just make everything open. Because I can promise you if you don't have a culture like this right now, 20 to 25 of your, of your people want to run away. But you should ask yourself, maybe that's also better, mm -hmm. right? Because in essence, what you need to go towards is that you have a place where people share their ideas openly, you can debate them openly, and you as a founder or a leader of a team should be challenged openly as well. And the way you respond to that really determines in how much more likely people are going to respond to this. And what I found, for example, talking to a lot of other founders and business owners, is the reason why they don't trust uh, these surveys is because people are, are able to do something anonymously. And a trust works both ways, right? Trust doesn't really work just one way down or one way up. Also, the employee has the responsibility to speak up, to say, you know, this matters. I need to do something about this. Because the reality is, like, it's notion in your head that often prevents you from actually thinking, oh, shit, I might get fired. If you get fired, it's not the freaking company you're supposed to work at in the first place if you can't share your ideas. Mm -hmm. And that's something I, I think this is a, Yeah, this is a very... Uh, I'd like to actually go ahead and, and, and interrupt you here, sorry. Um, it's, I think it's a, it's a very interesting topic and it's certainly an area where data and analytics uh, can, be, can be heavily applied and it very much tie is tied to, to, how to how to and how to not maybe build, build a data-driven culture, but actually something, because we are limited of time, something that I actually would like to touch upon as well, uh, considering that we have Kave with us as well, um, highly experienced in recruiting, because recruiting is an area of HR where I think we have done pretty well. We have managed pretty far in terms of utilizing um, data and analytics to make better decision, cut costs, etc. Tell us a little bit more about this, and what would your recommendations to, let's say, either an HR manager or simply a CEO or, or someone, um, uh, you know, business owner responsible for the area of HR, what would you recommend for someone who wants to become more, more data-driven in the area of recruiting? So the way I want to put this is HR is an umbrella and you have various elements in there like recruiting, talent retention, you have your culture, you have conversation, right? And what I've seen or what I've experienced is that we focus a lot on creating the best recruiting, you know, strategies and processes given the, the data that we're collecting, but we're not moving beyond that, yeah? So we were increasing the numbers of applicants, we're processing them well, you know, in some cases, hopefully, or we're not processing them well. But what happens after that? As a manager, HR manager, you have to think beyond recruiting. And I think this is where data become really important. You want to make sure that these people that are coming in are actually able to stay. So you have to develop a sustainable model based on how it has been going on for the last year, hopefully, in order for you to predict how the next years could come. But of course, because of the way business is, business demands, you know, from the executive, they want to see results, they want to see you hire people and get stuff done, okay? And when it comes to developing a plan for you to retain people, actually the pulse of accelerating business is usually a hardcore demand or a hardcore request to present to business leaders because most of the time they just, they will, feel that, okay, that's okay that we want to improve the culture, but actually we just need five more people or 10 more people, <laughs> okay? Is, and that's what we want to see. Um, so I will say as an HR manager, you've got to be, um, um, you've got to put your foot down and demonstrate the value of data that's coming in or actually demonstrate how your peers or peers in the market are using data to actually set up a culture that will be able to retain good people 
And in that way, you're not just wasting a lot of money attracting and recruiting and failing at retention. And the last thing that I want to talk about is culture. Retention is failing because of culture. And why culture? It's because we're not setting up first the culture that we want. What is the culture that we want? We know the culture that we don't want as organizations, but actually what is it that we want? And executives and leaders and HR managers should actually set the tone of what we want so we work along with the people that are coming in to set up this culture. Yeah? Um, so HR managers, you know, put your foot down show the value of data to the executive and make sure they give you a budget, you know, for HR analytics, employees, you know, teammates. So you hear that, old topic. founders in the room? <laughs> make sure <laughs> HR's budget. Topic. Because <laughs> honestly, many organizations are yet to have HR analytics team members in the HR department, so. Yeah. I want to just add to it. This yeah. is exactly the same trend as is going on in product and user behavior analytics. Right, so we're seeing, we've been seeing so much emphasis on marketing analytics, getting users through the door into the landing page, signing up, um, but then, then the important thing happens. Are you actually building a product that people like? Um, will they stay there? And how do you analyze the marketing funnels, the recruiting funnels, right? Uh, who there becomes actually valuable users, val valuable employees, exactly the same thing. Uh, can I add a little bit of to course, the, yeah. um, the subject earlier? Um, I just wanted to add also, I, I love the radical transparency. Um, I've been in a company uh, that did a lot of that as well. There was some conflict in the management though about doing that, um, and they're actually running another company right now that they again have this conflict. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, so they, whether radical transparency and people, whether teams, team members are ready for it, basically. But this is a trust issue also down, right? It's management trusting their employees. Um, but I wanted to also touch upon it from the perspective of sort of basically one-on-ones also, which uh, I think is uh, a really important qualitative data, right? Um, and I think there is nothing more important that, than, that, you, than you, that you emphasize than that there is like a layer of one-on-ones where everyone can sort of talk and share what they what they think. And we have a really similar thing that you do with weekly check-ins. Um, I find it interesting that you always go first there. I think I should adopt that, ad adopt that because I, s I sort of have the tendency to wait also until last there. But there's a hugely different uh, aspect of being sort of creating a data-driven culture or let's say using analytics on people health um, in a tiny company. I'm currently in a tiny company called Avo, the CEO and co-founder of Avo. We're making sure your analytics never breaks again. Um, and we're four people that are there every week and then we have some other people. So that's where one-on-ones is the most important tools. Retrospectives with like sharing what happened, what, did, what, what went well in the last week and what didn't. Um, feeling check-ins like, okay, this makes me glad, sad, afraid, uh, mad. Um, so, and then one of the most important tools that we have in such a small team is we are now 10 months in um, or 11 months in. And so we actually have monthly OKR reviews, not quarterly, because everything changes so quickly for us. Um, there are just so many curveballs that we sort of deal with. And I think um, I would probably qualify that as it's data, but it's sort of more like quantitative, uh, qualitative data because we sit down, we review our goal for the month, and then we review our sort of key results and why we failed. We do the five whys on why we failed on something or why we su succeeded on something. So that's another angle I just wanted to bring into here, like the qu qualitative, basically. Um, if I may, I want to add something and actually share two um, things with you guys. Um, one that I took away today from Cassie's talk. I don't know who has seen it. The Cassie Kazakov. Yeah, exactly. Super, I can super highly recommend following her on Twitter. Uh, it's Kesita. It's the like the m one of the most inspiring blogs and, and Twitter feeds that you can find on the topic. She's of so cool. She's <laughs> amazing. Um, so one thing that she actually made me understand even better today, and I really recommend digging deeper into this, is that when we say data, we don't mean data. When we say data in this particular context, I think what we mean is analytics. 
which basically is a combination of data and concepts. The concepts usually come from some sort of social science background, be it philosophy, psychology, um, any kind of sciences where we actually understand concepts. So the combination of concepts and any kind of data, be it qualitative, be it in the moment, be it big data and um, quantitative data, is really important because in the end, I think the add-on in the people sector or the HR sector doesn't come from just like looking at some data. And that's why also this particular area, I also consider as failed, like just looking at engagement surveys for years, like that's not gonna do the trick. It's about understanding what you can learn from this particular set of analytics that you're looking at, whatever it may be. And to ensure that you actually have a steady stream of them, be it in like qualitative touch points or in collection of a bigger sets of data. I think that's really, really important. And that's like the first step of data literacy. And the second thing that I wanted um, in on the topic of culture for you guys to just take away, um, there is super interesting research done by Charles O'Reilly from Stanford GSB, um, one of our partners, scientific partners, um, that we've built into the product that basically has found out that the financial performance of teams and companies is not so much related to um, actually one specific kind of culture, be it transparent or not, but it's actually driven by having a consistent understanding of what values and norms are important in a context. And that context should actually not be driven by founders' personalities, but actually what your customers and business requires. So if your people are paying, like your customers are paying you for quality, then you need to have a culture that ensures high quality standards. If your customers are paying you for adaptability and innovation, you need to have a very adaptable okay, culture. That and really that's a definition that you actually need to make as a leader, where you don't really have enough mental models currently, back to education around the topic, to be able to clarify that and then to hire accordingly and to okay. re um, retain people accordingly. So um, very worth checking out research. Just one sentence I yes. want to, add to, <laughs> to agree. Data is not the same thing as information, right? Yeah. So always, you're always looking for information and that you design your data to get the information that you need. Yeah, and that's actually the, the closing words because we're, we're rounding up now. That's actually also what, what I want to summarize this with. I think it was here in Data Natives yesterday, someone made a statement that big data is dead. It was so hot a few years ago where everyone just thought that big data is data and not data analytics. And I think that's extremely crucial to remember that don't just sit on your data lakes and don't gather the data because that's not to build a data-driven culture and that's not to apply analytics and make better decisions. Here, here. Thank you so much.